Hey everyone, welcome back. I hope you all had a great start to the new year um, and hopefully uh, you're all making progress on your uh, science tests from the biology unit which we finished before the break. Um, now we're moving on past our biology unit into our physics unit um, and we're going to spend the rest of the year talking about physics and then uh, astronomy. So um, we'll spend about nine or ten videos talking about physics and then we'll spend another nine or ten videos uh, talking about uh, talking about astronomy. Um, so I'm hoping you'll see about one video a week but uh, it might be a little bit more a little bit less at different times depending on how my uh, coursework is going. Um, I've got a couple of really easy looking classes and a couple of terribly scary looking classes this term so uh, depending on uh, what's going on for me you might see me upload a little bit extra some weeks or a little bit less in uh, in other weeks but I'm going to try to keep it um, relatively organized uh, and quite similar from one week to the next. Um, now this is the beginning of our physics unit and physics is uh, a branch of science that uses a lot of math um, to, to describe you know what's going on so uh, don't worry too much about the math what we're going to do in the next couple of lessons is we're going to build up a little bit of the foundational stuff that you would need uh, if you were to talk about something like motion um, from a uh, from a mathematical perspective if you're talking about something like motion uh, we're going to see how you can use math to describe motion uh, but then for the rest of the physics unit, I just want to dive into some of the more uh, interesting topics, some things that you guys might want to actually learn about, because motion, as useful as it is, uh, it could be really boring to talk about motion for, for 10 lessons, um, and I'm not, uh, I'm not sure that's the best way to go um, in teaching this class. So we're going to spend a couple of lessons talking about motion and the sort of somewhat basic math that's involved with it. And then we'll sort of ditch the math and then we'll just think about everything else uh, as uh, using ideas and pictures. And we'll just talk about these other areas of physics to give you an idea of uh, how broad a spectrum uh, physics can really cover. Um, so we're going to get into a, a little bit of that in this lesson as well. So like I said on that first slide, physics covers a lot of different stuff, and I've just put a list here uh, for you to uh, for you to have a look at the different kinds of things that can fall under the purview of physics. So um, if you Google physics and the definition of it, it'll say something about matter and the motion of of said matter and uh, the behavior of space and time, the uh, the concept of energy. The concept of force, maybe light, so kind of this stuff here is what you might see on like the Wikipedia page for um, for physics. But there are lots of other things that fall into uh, the study of physics, and some of them are tremendously complicated, and some of them just don't get talked about um, quite as much as uh, as these other things. Um, so another thing that falls under the umbrella of physics is electricity and actually related to electricity is magnetism. So uh, there's something that we can uh, that we can talk about in a few lessons time, hopefully, uh, or perhaps on one of our one of our Zoom calls is that electricity and magnetism are linked to one another. And that came through doing different experiments and using a lot of math. Uh, in in a physics type context. So uh, lots of experiments and theoretical work, theoretical work meaning math basically, um, uh, is done by physicists to learn more about all of these different kinds of things. So there are still lots of things that we don't know uh, a ton about. So for example, matter sounds like a fairly basic idea. It's probably something you've heard about many, many times before in your science classes. And we tend to think of matter as stuff that's made of atoms, right? Atoms make up the matter that we see in the world around us. But I've put atoms down here, and that's something that, while it's 
definitely a part of science. It's something that many people would associate with chemistry more than they would associate with physics. So the interesting thing is, if you're looking at atoms and how they interact with other atoms, you could be talking about stuff like the periodic table, things like that from chemistry. Or you can look at an atom by itself and you can ask, okay, what's an atom made out of? This still sounds like something from a chemistry class. Then you get into, okay, well, an atom is made out of protons and neutrons and electrons. Great. What are those things made out of? This is where you get into a branch of physics called particle physics, which looks at what the smallest units of stuff, the smallest units of matter really are, what they're made of. Uh, well, or actually, well, if it's the smallest unit of matter, it shouldn't be made of anything else. But anyway, um, what are the smallest units of matter? Uh, how do they behave? How do they interact with each other? What happens if you smash them together? Things like that all falls into the study of particle physics, which is, of course, a branch of physics, but it incorporates this study of atoms in a way that you wouldn't see in a chemistry class. Um, in a chemistry class, you'll look at things like you've got uh, you've got an atomic nucleus, like like let's say lithium, right? Lithium, and then you've got you've got a couple of electrons that are orbiting here. And then you've got another shell out here and you've got another electron out there. This is the kind of stuff that you would see in a chemistry class when you're talking about atoms and the different atoms on the periodic table and how the number of protons in the nucleus in here relates to the number of electrons uh, that you'll find out here. Uh, so that's the kind of stuff that you'd see in a chemistry class. In a physics class, uh, in, in particular, if you're looking at a particle physics class, you might focus more on the stuff that's in the nucleus. So the nucleus of an atom contains protons and neutrons, and particle physics is concerned with, okay, well, if I blew up this, not blew up like explode, blew up like enlarged, like zoomed in, into a picture of a nucleus, then I'll see some protons. Let's draw them in red. I'll see some protons in there, and I'll see them bounded together by a few neutrons, something like this. And so I've got those neutrons in blue. And you'll have something like this, right, as your uh, atomic nucleus. And then in particle physics, what we're studying is what's inside those. So if you were to take one of these protons, let me put a different colored box around it. So we got, so you take one of these protons, for instance, and then you enlarge that. And then what do you see? What's a proton made out of? And you can learn more about the structure of matter by looking at that. So if I look at one proton, so this is my one proton. And then what's that proton made out of? And that's stuff that we can get into later on in this unit. Uh, the math of this is tremendously complicated. Um, and it's stuff that I actually still haven't studied. It's stuff I will be studying um, this, uh, this term. But uh, this is the kind of stuff that uh, you'd see in a physics class when you're talking about atoms, that you're looking at what atoms are made of and what those constituent particles are made of and what their constituent particles are made of until you get to the smallest, truly uncuttable, most basic components of nature. So the way that uh, you could think about it is that like the same way that uh, sentences are made of words and words are made of letters and then the letters themselves, you can't cut them any further, right? The letters are the smallest units of the language that you can have. Uh, it's the same idea in this branch of physics where you're looking for those smallest units, but instead of language, it's the smallest units of matter, the smallest stuff you could find in nature. So that's all under the purview of physics, electricity and magnetism. So stuff with, uh, you'll often see if you Google electricity and magnetism, you'll see something like 
a magnet and a bolt of lightning or something like that, right? That falls under physics. The way lightning behaves is a physics thing. The way magnets and compasses work, that's a physics thing. Gravity, something that uh, we've known is a thing for a long time, but something that still isn't perfectly understood. We've got uh, Einstein's theory of relativity, which replaced Newton's theory of gravity uh, to explain how gravitational interactions work. Uh, but even his theory is not a complete final theory. It still needs more work. So um, even things that we thought we understood turns out need some more work. There's lots of lots of interesting stuff uh, in this uh, uh, in this branch of science. And uh, of course, you know, you get the, the things that everybody would have heard about a couple of years ago. Many of you saw this with me was that first picture of, uh, of a black hole. Um, but yeah, things like that. So there's there's a lot that goes on in physics. And my goal in this unit is to show you guys some of those things and dive into sort of a, 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 a qualitative, so like a, using pictures and ideas instead of numbers and math, a qualitative idea of what these different things are and why we think we know what we know and stuff like that. So we'll jump into all of those things in the lessons to come. So here, just to give you guys uh, an idea of some of the variation that you'll see in physics, there's lots and lots of different stuff that falls into this category. So you can see here, we've got electricity, we've got magnetism, uh, we've got gravity, uh, which I mentioned on the last slide and closely related to gravity is this black holes one here. Here's that picture of a black hole from a couple of years ago, um, which you guys uh, hope some of you will remember uh, watching that uh, announcement with me. Here's just sort of an artist's drawing of a black hole uh, up here. Um, cosmology, and so some things, uh, well, actually lots of things relating to outer space uh, fall under a branch of, uh, sort of like a sub-branch of physics called astrophysics. Uh, and so that deals with the physics of stuff in space, how planets move, how stars form, how galaxies form, and how they interact with each other, um, things like that. Um, so, for example, I took a course on galaxies uh, last term, and you learn about things like uh, you can tell what kind of stuff a galaxy might be made of, like elements-wise, by looking at its color or by taking a picture of it in not visible light, but some other light, like x-rays or infrared light. You can learn all of these different things about stuff way out in space just by taking pictures of them and then sort of reasoning your way out with a lot of math uh, to get uh, to get meaningful answers. Um, and so all of these things fall under the branch of uh, science that we call physics. We've also got atomic physics. So it's neat because we've got things that are very, very big so things like stars and planets, and of course galaxies like we're seeing over here. Uh, and we've got things that are very, very small. If you can see here, there's a little scale that I've written. Well, no, I didn't write this in, but I, I kept it in the picture because I wanted to talk about it. So this says, if in, if in case you can't see it, uh, this thing right here says one, and then an A with a, with a little circle on it. And this is called an angstrom, and it's it's uh, a very very small unit uh, unit of distance. It's what something like a ten billionth of a meter or something like that. Let's see, hang on, a billionth would be yeah, I think it's a ten billionth of a meter. I'm hoping I got that right. Um, but yeah, it's a very very small unit of distance. And what this is saying is that from here to here, if this distance was one angstrom, this is how big your helium atom would be, which is very small, right? So um, so all of these different things fall into what we call uh, physics. Now, in terms of the things that we'll cover, 
we'll talk a little bit about motion in this lesson. It's a fairly basic concept and I don't want to jump into the math uh, right away. So uh, we're not going to jump uh, into a lot of math. I'm just going to talk a little bit about a couple of things about motion just to sort of get you thinking about it. And then when we have our Zoom classes, we can talk more about it, things that you have questions about, uh, things that you found interesting. Maybe you want to know more about a specific type of motion. We'll talk a little bit about the different types of motion right at the end of this lesson, uh, things like that. We'll talk about velocity and acceleration. So we'll talk about this, uh, this one here, this lesson. Um, I think I'm going to incorporate acceleration due to gravity in this lesson. So this will all kind of be one thing. Uh, and this one, this will all include uh, a decent amount of math. Uh, I'm not going to test you heavily on the math, so don't stress out about it. I just want to show you what the math looks like. Uh, and then we'll move on to some stuff that's uh, more, uh, more we're just thinking in terms of ideas. And I might tweak this as we go. Uh, forces uh, along with motion, these are things that you would study in like a grade 11 physics class. This stuff you don't really study in in high school physics. This would be upper year university physics. Um, we're not going to we're not going to approach it at that sort of level. We're just going to talk about it from uh, from a more basic uh, from a more basic perspective. Um, and I might, if just time permitting, we'll see. I might throw in a couple of other lessons about things like electricity and magnetism, um, or uh, a little bit more of quantum mechanics. I mean, this stuff at the bottom here, these last two, they involve some stuff from quantum mechanics, but uh, we uh, we could explore quantum mechanics from a different perspective. And just to just to get a feel for the kinds of things that uh, that make quantum mechanics so weird. So um, lots of there's lots of different ways we could go with this and. Uh, this is just sort of a rough idea of some of the things I want to talk about, uh, but I'll ask you guys when we have our first Zoom class if there's anything specific that you want to focus on or something that you'd rather skip over in favor of something else, um, then we can talk about that and tweak it uh, going forward. So as we saw at the end of the previous slide, there was a little bit there about the fundamental interactions uh, of nature. And so this is basically referring to uh, the four forces that sort of govern how all of matter and energy uh, behave. These are the, the rules. If the whole universe was a game, these would be the rules that decide how the pieces are allowed to move. Um, and so the four uh, interactions, there's a lot of math that goes into it. We're just going to approach it from a conceptual point of view. I've taken this picture out of Brian Greene's uh, documentary, The Elegant Universe, which I uh, posted in our Google Classroom. So if you guys want to check it out, uh, please feel free because it's going to come in handy in our uh, in our physics unit. You, you don't have to, but if you're interested, I think it's, it'll be really good for you to check out. Um, but so the four fundamental interactions are gravity. That's this big one, this big G over here. Uh, we've got electromagnetism down here and then so here this E is for the electricity um, and this M is for the magnetism. And then the S up here stands for the strong nuclear force. And that's responsible for holding uh, protons and neutrons together in the nucleus of an atom. So you can kind of see that when you're looking at, if you see this sort of this red ball peeking out and the blue ones over here, um, those are protons and neutrons and what they're trying to show in that picture is the strong nuclear force is what holds them all together. And then we've got the weak nuclear force which is responsible for uh, radioactivity. And when we talk about these different interactions we can talk about what that means because for years all I ever heard about the weak nuclear force is that it's responsible for radioactivity and radioactive decay but I never really understood how. So there's stuff that we can talk about there. Um, but yeah, so these are the kinds of things that we'll talk about, not from a mathematical perspective, because the math gets crazy complicated for some of these things. Um, actually, for all of these things, I think. Um, but we're just going to talk about the different, uh, these different ideas and sort of what they mean for our understanding of nature, 
uh, and things like that. So not anything for you to stress about. It's mostly going to be uh, just discussions and looking at pictures and trying to understand what those pictures mean and then talking about that in our Zoom classes. But for the first couple of lessons where we're not talking about this complicated stuff uh, and we're just talking about the basics like, uh, like motion uh, and acceleration and things like that, um, we'll see a little bit of math there just so you get a feel for how we can use math to understand these ideas in nature. So I'll show you sort of the basic case where here's a basic problem in physics, here's how you can solve it using math, and then we'll just look at a bunch of other problems without diving into the math of how you can solve them. So now we can get into our introduction to motion for real. Uh, so we've gone through uh, sort of a, a sort of a preview to what the kinds of things that we're going to see in the physics unit. Now I don't want to bore you with the motion stuff, so it's only going to be a couple of slides. I just want to point out um, uh, a couple of things to sort of think about, uh, just to get the the juices flowing in your brains for uh, for the stuff that's about to come. So one uh, interesting place to start is to try to describe what motion is. And that's something that if it's, if it's intuitive to you, intuitive meaning that uh, you, you just know, right? So like if I, if I asked you, why is the sky blue? And you don't know the reasoning behind it, but you know the sky is blue. Uh, or maybe a better question would be, what color is the sky? And you might say blue. I mean, I hope you'd say blue, but whatever. You might say blue. Uh, and then I ask you, why is the sky blue? And you say, well, it just it just is. Um, now, there is a physical reason to why the sky is blue, but if you don't know that, that doesn't change the fact that you know what blue is and you know how the sky changes color from the middle of the day to sunset, you have this intuitive understanding that, okay, when the sun is high in the sky, the sky is blue. And when the sun is low in the sky, it's like yellowish, orangish, reddish. So you have this understanding of how the, the sky changes color. You have an understanding of how this works, but not a really deep understanding of how it works. So if I asked you to explain why and how the sky changes color, most people wouldn't be able to do that, right? Um, even though they know how it changes color and they can connect it to the sun's position in the sky. So an interesting place to start with motion is to try to describe what motion actually is. And the simplest way to describe it is that it's a change in your position or a change in your location. You could use the same, you could use the, the, that word there. Now, of course, from a mathematical perspective, if you wanted to uh, be able to describe your position, then you would need to bring in our our friend from last year, the Cartesian plane, and you've got like a, you've got your x axis, you've got your y axis, maybe you've got a z axis if you want, and then you've got a bunch of grid lines here that sort of mark off the different positions, right? So we will we'll talk about the Cartesian plane in our in our math class, but if you wanted to mathematically describe a position then you would need to introduce something like this, this coordinate system, so that you, if you plonk down your location right here, you can say, okay, well, if this is 0, 1, 2, then okay, I'm two units to the right of of whatever, of where whoever's looking at you, some observer is right here, then you can say, okay, I'm two units to the right of that person, and I'm 1, 2, three units above or north or whatever, right? So you need to be able to describe your motion compared to the position of something else. So of course here I haven't described motion, I've just described this position. Now if you're here and then you start walking and you start walking like this and then you turn and then you go somewhere else, you can describe your motion mathematically, but you still need this coordinate system to be able to describe it. And that's where the math comes in, is that we know this idea of position and motion. Now we need to translate it into math so that we can, uh, so that we can use that uh, 
to to figure out a whole bunch of other stuff about nature. Basically, all our uh, uh, I used to joke with my my friends a couple of years ago is that all our problems in physics happen because something moved and we didn't know why. And I'm sure that's not entirely true, but I think it encapsulates a lot of physics is just down to things moving. And sometimes they're moving in ways we didn't expect. And uh, sometimes we're trying to, so some areas of physics are trying to figure out why things move the way they do. And uh, what's the fastest you can go? And what happens if you try to go faster than that? And what happens if you're really small and you're also moving really fast? What happens if you're really small and I try to trap you in a really small location? All of these different things fall under physics and a lot of it is basically just talking about motion uh, and motion that has confused us uh, over time, us meaning like humanity. Um, but yeah, so the basic description here is that motion is a change in position. So if you started here and you ended up over here, then you could draw a, an arrow, you could draw your path from start to finish and that path describes your motion. And now, of course, you can always do that in a graph and say, okay, well, yeah, I started right here and I finished right here. And so therefore you can see my motion. Um, but our goal in this unit is to describe motion mathematically. And then you can draw out the stuff uh, that you get from the math and you can get one of these pictures back. So we'll, uh, we'll look at that uh, later on in our unit. We'll also talk about some other things in the next couple of lessons when we jump into the math of this stuff. We'll talk about words like displacement and velocity and stuff like that. Um, and uh, it's, uh, it's, it might be a little bit overwhelming the next lesson or two, but uh, I promise there's not gonna be a ton of math after that, um, except of course in our math course. But uh, in this class, there won't be a ton more uh, math and there certainly won't be any crazy math that I'm expecting you to be able to do uh, on the test. So this point at the bottom here is the last thing I want to talk about on this slide. There is no motion except relative motion. This is an idea in physics. This is basically the, this is related to the the, the principle of, of relativity. Um, well, this is related to Einstein's theory of relativity, which is based on this Galileo's uh, principle of relativity. So, um, and that basically we got this understanding from Galileo and I believe somebody else, but I'm forgetting the name, um, that if you want to measure your motion, so like this arrow up here, if you want to measure your motion, you have to be measuring your motion relative to something else. It doesn't make sense to say you're moving, uh, three meters south if there's nothing that you can point at and say okay well that thing's not moving and that thing would say I'm moving three meters south therefore I'm moving three meters south uh, if you're moving three meters south but everything around you is also moving three meters south you can't tell that you're moving and so that's uh, an example of motion where we can't tell that we're in motion is that we're all in motion around the sun, but because us and our computers and our family members and our beds and our tables and our chairs are all moving at the same speed, it looks like nothing's moving at all. Um, and so that's why <clears throat> you could say, well, compared to my desk, I'm not moving because I'm sitting still, my desk is sitting still, but compared to the sun, I am moving because the sun can see the earth moving along its orbit, right? And the sun could say, well, I'm not moving, but the earth is moving. Uh, and the galaxy would say, well, actually, no, the sun is also moving because the galaxy, like the center of the galaxy can see all the stars going around as well. So motion is not absolute. It's not gonna be one answer uh, every single time. Just because you think you've moved three meters south doesn't mean everybody will agree that you've moved three meters south. So things like that, those are the kinds of things that I just want you to think about. It's not something I'm gonna quiz you on, um, but just something to think about is uh, how your description of the universe is not necessarily the same as the next guy's description of the universe. You could be using the exact same concepts and the exact same math and whatever, but if one of you happens to be moving differently, 
then you'll get different answers. So things like that. So something that you'll uh, hopefully have heard of before is that if when people think of motion, sometimes they'll think of Newton's laws of motion, given that it has motion in the name. So I thought it's worth mentioning the laws in sort of a simple form. We're not diving into any math and we're not going to explain the laws here. We'll talk about them in our uh, forces unit. Um, as you can see, we've got force here and we've got force here. Uh, so this is uh, stuff that's connected to forces, but forces are connected to motion, and so that's why we've got them here. So the three laws are Newton's first law, an object at rest remains at rest unless acted upon by an external force. So that basically means that if you have an object like a ball sitting still, it's not going to magically start moving unless you apply a force to it. So that force could be you picking it up, it could be you kicking it, it could be you throwing it, um, it could be, I don't know, you turn on a, a fan and hold it really close to the ball, and if the ball is really light, it'll start rolling from the wind that you've generated, but you need to apply some sort of force to get it moving. There's a more complicated version of this, like there's a more complicated way to say this, which is also that an object with a constant velocity will continue traveling at that same velocity, uh, unless acted upon by an external force. So what that basically means is that um, if you've got a ball that's rolling in a straight line in some direction, then it's not going to magically change direction or change speed um, unless there's some sort of force. Now, obviously, when you roll a ball, after a little while, it stops. And the reason it stops is because of the force of friction slowing down the ball. But uh, but if you had a surface that doesn't uh, apply that force of friction, so if it was really, really smooth, people often think of things like ice. If you had a super smooth sheet of ice and you rolled a ball, it would probably roll farther because the force of friction would be smaller. But so basically the, the simple version is that if the object is not moving, it keeps not moving. And if it's already moving, it keeps moving the same way it already was unless you apply a force to it. Now, Newton's second law is that the force on an object is equal to the object's mass multiplied by its acceleration. So this is the uh, mathematical description of Newton's second law, which is force equals mass times acceleration. Now, when we write out multiplication using these letters, we don't put a multiplication sign. We just write the two letters side by side. Um, but yeah, so if this is something that you've seen before, F equals MA, uh, that's Newton's second law. Uh, and we'll talk about that in a few lessons time as well. And then Newton's third law is every force has an equal and opposite reaction force, which basically means that if I am pushing on a wall, the wall is also pushing on me. Um, and, uh, that's sort of the, that's sort of the idea that like, if I, I, I actually, I did this test with the hummingbirds. If you hold hands with one of the hummingbirds, like, uh, like your palms to their palms and you push on their hands, they have to push back in order to not fall over. Right. And if they push on your hands, then you have to push back in order to not fall over. Um, and so that's something that you can test out just by, you know, getting another person and then locking hands and trying to trying to basically trying to pu push them over and uh, have them resist by pushing you back. Uh, and so that's sort of a, a, a demonstration of Newton's third law. Like I said, we'll talk about these again in a few videos time. So last thing, super quick, um, we're only going to talk about uh, sort of the basics uh, of motion, but there are lots and lots of different types uh, of motion that you could uh, that you could think about. So the first example here is rotation. So that's basically anything that's spinning. So if you have uh, a wheel and it's spinning, then that's a form of motion called rotational motion. And the second one, the second one here is translation. So that's like if I have a, a flat surface and I have a box on it 
and then I push the box and the box ends up over here. So I haven't tipped it over or anything, I've just moved it over. That's a translation. Then there's oscillations, so that would be things like a pendulum. So you've got like a ceiling there, and then you've got a pendulum, and the pendulum swings back and forth, right, out that way, and then once it comes back, it goes out the other way. Um, and then this last one, projectile motion. So if I draw that up here, so that's the, that's the kind of thing where like if I have a flat piece of land and then this cliff and I've got a cannon down here. Right, I've got like a cannon down here. What speed do I have to fire uh, uh, the cannonball at to get it to land up here on top of the cliff? So that kind of stuff falls in uh, falls under projectile motion. And we'll talk about a little bit of that um, in uh, in a lesson or two. Uh, that's sort of what you focus on in about grade 11 uh, physics here in Canada, um, or at least here, here in, in, in my province and in my school, this is what we focused on. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so we'll talk a little bit about these different things. We won't get into too much uh, of the math aside from some of the basics that we'll see in the next two lessons. Um, and, uh, and then that'll, that'll basically be it. And we'll start talking about other aspects of physics, so things like forces and then those fundamental uh, uh, interactions and stuff like that. So that's about it for this lesson. Our next lesson we'll be talking about uh, velocity and acceleration and this lesson has uh, just been an intro to motion but without any math really. The next one, don't be scared by this terminology. We're going to talk about it uh, in detail in our next lesson. Um, vector quantities are basically just numbers that also have a direction associated with them. So, for example, uh, three meters is not a vector, but three meters east is a vector. So we'll get into that next lesson. Uh, if you guys have any questions, leave a comment or send me an email or whatever, and I will see you all in the next video. Have a good one.